So we, we are live, and, and uh, like I said, we were talking about earlier before uh, church has begun, uh, that there's going to be a way to step back and, and kind of solidify and, and justify why we believe what we believe. And as we've been doing this study on Leviticus, uh, I remember when I did my doctorate that um, I remember that um, I talked about salvation through the tabernacle. And, uh, and, and that was an amazing study for me. And I learned so much from the Word of God and, and how that uh, justice and grace and mercy were blended together through Jesus Christ. And uh, I'll be giving you a little bit later, if not today, maybe tonight, uh, probably a link on our website that has to do with the tabernacle. And, and I think it would be uh, good for you and I to go back and kind of review that and the knowledge that goes with it, because truth is only truth of what's been presented to me. So, Brother James, if I, even if, it, if you've never known truth, and I were to give you a half-truth with a half-lie, then that becomes your truth. And Lady Karen, you wouldn't know any different. Okay? Uh, a lot of times we see people today that are raised differently than what we were raised, and in different circumstances that we ever did. And so for them... Uh, it's just that that's just truth to them until the real truth is discovered. And the scariest verse in the Bible for me is in Matthew. And it says, and few there be that find it. We're talking about salvation. And so to me, that's always horrified me to think of how many people are going to go through life thinking that they've got the truth. But they've only got half of it. And when you think about it, uh, we as Christians... And I'm going to get right into uh, chapter 9 here in just a second of Leviticus. But we're also going to be in the book of Acts, uh, uh, chapter 2. Uh, hi, Catherine. Good to see you. And we, we love you, girl, and, and you and James. And thank you for always being faithful and tuning in. But I think you'll find the studies that we're doing on Leviticus very eye-opening uh, to your faith. But once again, let's ask you this. You know, if your faith is based on a half of a truth, and half of a lie, even though to you it's a full truth, but it's still only half. But once you read the Word of God, and you begin to understand where God is coming from, we know that God is love. And we understand that on Calvary, that Jesus, uh, who had no sin, knew no sin, became our sin for us. So we're going to get a little bit deeper into that a little bit later so we can understand, well, how is that love? And we'll get into that. But once again, we want to expose the truth because the Bible teaches that the truth will set you free, right? And so let's get right into, we've been talking about the offerings of the consecration, but in chapter 9, and we're going to be also in the book of Acts, chapter 2, and I hope you'll go ahead and mark both those places in your Bible. And so uh, the first offering of Aaron and for himself for the people but I want you to see some things that you might have uh, as a young preacher I just glanced through it I overlooked a lot of things and now after being in the ministry for so many years and pastoring for 37 of those so many years um, there's a lot of things that I've had time to look at and to really think about and to solidify and justify what it is I believe and I want to make sure that what I believe is based on the full truth not a half-truth, okay? So let's look at Leviticus chapter 9, and, and we'll start in, in verse 1, and I'll read and I'll explain a few things as we go, and I hope it's going to be an eye-opener for you. hope it solidifies your faith and that your trust and belief. But, I, you know, it's kind of amazing that uh, a lot of people uh, today, they still honor the Sabbath day, and, and, uh, and they give the whole day. And yet, you know, to... Uh, worshiping the Lord and, and, and thinking about the Lord and studying the Lord and everything else. And the reason why we as Christians uh, uh, honor the first day of the week is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we've already done our study. Uh, Brother James, if you remember, we talked about in the book of Hebrews how what an eye-opener that book is. You know, uh, Lady Karen, the book of Romans, especially starting in, you know, in, in chapter 3 all the way through and and what an eye-opener those are to revealing the absolute truth about grace and love and mercy and justice, you know. 
a God who knew no sin became sin uh, for you and I. What a thought that is. And we who are sinful knew nothing about the grace and mercy of God, but through Christ we're able to have that. So we got to find a way to understand this because a lot of people will devote a whole day to, you know, learning the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, studying the Word of God, uh, praising, singing songs. I remember as a young preacher, uh, the first uh, uh, Sunday of every month, uh, I mean the first Saturday of every month, everybody got together. and We spent the whole day, they were called church arbor meetings. And, and uh, oh my gosh, I mean, preacher after preacher after preacher would get up, and singer after singer after singer would get up, and we'd have our meals, and we spent the whole day. And we walked out so enlightened by the presence of God in our lives. It was amazing. But nowadays, here's what we do, Lady Karen. If we're lucky to get 30 to 40 minutes in, into the Word of God, and then we've been about doing our, our worldly business before church, and then as soon as we get through a church, we go right back into our worldly business. And, we, and, tell, and for some people, uh, they may, uh, Catherine, they may show up for Sunday night, maybe even. But as soon as they get, uh, before they come to church, they, they're not reading their Bible, they're not praising God, they're not praying together. What are they doing? They're involved with the world. And as soon as they get out of church, boom, they're right back into the world. And so that can lead to a problem. We need a day of rest, of celebration. We need a day that's completely set aside so the whole day, not a part of the day, is given, giving God our attention. And he wants to communicate with us. So let's go back to Leviticus chapter 9, verse 1. And let's look at this. And it came to pass on the eighth day, okay, that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elder, elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, now he's getting very specific here. He said to Aaron, Aaron, I want you to take thee a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. Now notice he said, you're going to do this for yourself. Now this is important. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and a calf of a, and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish, and a burnt offering. And also a bullock and a ram, and a peace offering to sacrifice before the Lord, and a meat offering may, uh, um, offered mingled with oil. Uh, for today the Lord will appear unto you. And I want you to circle that. For today the Lord will appear unto you unto you. What a phenomenal phrase that is. And they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do. And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Now circle that. Not only will, uh, uh, will the Lord appear unto you, but the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Two different phrases here, and we'll break this out a little bit later. And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar and offer thy, so the word thy, thy sin offering and thy burnt offering and make an atonement for thyself. And then he says, and for the people. So he was to make an atonement for himself first and then for the people and offer the offering of the people and made a atonement for them as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron therefore went unto the altar and he slew the calf of the sin offering which was for himself. Notice that it had to do with the blood, doesn't it? And the sons of Aaron brought, now this is important, the sons of Aaron brought the blood unto him. Notice he couldn't bring the blood of it for himself. You see it's not something that we acquire not something we earn or something we do. So even Aaron had to wait for somebody to bring the blood to him. And he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar. Now, if you know the brazen altar, uh, God had to start the fire in that altar. Otherwise, it would be unholy fire. So he started the fire, and they would maintain the fire, but it had a horn on all four sides, okay? North, south, east, and west, in other words. And uh, so he goes over and puts the blood on all four of the horns, okay? And he says uh, in verse 9, And put it upon the horns of the altar, and pour out the blood on the bottom of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the cow, uh, above the liver of the sin offering, the burnt un un 
upon the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. And the flesh and the hide he burnt with fire without the camp. And he slew the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood. Now, did you get that? You see, we can never acquire salvation on our own. And so it has to be given to us. So the blood of Christ, the mercy of Christ, uh, the atonement of Christ, uh, the love of Christ, it has to be given. And so uh, it, 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 even if you're a, a priest or a pastor or you're in the ministry, the fact is uh, it's, it's not something that you and I do. So he couldn't do it for himself. It had to be done for him, which is a lesson that Christ had to do it for us. That's why he died on the cross, to shed his blood and made an atonement uh, for our sin. And so he says in verse 12, And he slew uh, the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood. So underline that. Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled round and about the altar. And they presented the burnt offering unto him again. Even the burnt offering, even though he had slain it, it had to be presented to him. And they presented the burnt offering unto him with the pieces thereof and the head, and he burnt them upon the altar. And he did wash the inwards and the legs and burnt them upon uh, the burnt offering on the altar. Verse 15, and he brought the people's offering. Notice they couldn't do it for themselves, and Aaron couldn't do it for himself. It had to be presented. Uh, his sons presented it to him, and he presented it to the people. And so and he brought the people's offering and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, slew it, and offered it for sin as the first. It was the first thing he had to do. And he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to the manner, okay, to their custom. And he brought the meat offering and took a handful thereof and burned it upon the altar beside the burnt offering uh, uh, of the morning. Verse 18. He slew also the bullock and the ram for the sacrifice of the peace offering. Notice, without the blood, there can be no peace. Did y'all get that? Without the sacrifice of the blood for sin, there can be no peace within. Let me say it again. If it wasn't for the blood of peace, all right, uh, I mean the blood of sacrifice uh, that would cover our sins, uh, there could be no peace within. So and he said, which was for the people. And Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, underline that, which he sprinkled upon the altar round about. And the fat, now, now think about this, Brother James, if he'd have done it for himself, they might have looked to, to him as, 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 the sac, as the high priest, right? That would, that would take away their sin. But even Aaron said, hey, I'm, I, I can't do, I can't take away my sin. It had to be presented to him just as it was going to be presented to the people. Does that make sense? So the same salvation that I've acquired through Jesus Christ is no different than the same salvation that Lady Karen, you've acquired. Or Brother James, you or Catherine and those that are watching. Uh, it, it's something that has to be given to us. It's a gift of God. And we're going to go a lot in that a little bit later. And so he says, and they put the fat upon the breast and the burnt and the fat upon the altar. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry, verse uh, 19. And the fat of the bullock and of the ram, the, the rump and that, which covered the inwards and the kidneys and the cowl above the liver and they put the fat upon the uh, breast and he burnt the fat upon the altar and uh, and the breast and the right shoulder Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord we talked about this a, a week or two ago as Moses commanded so they grabbed a hold of this thing and they mm -hmm. waved it as in a sense of for praise right and so Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. Notice, sin offering, burnt offering, peace offering, divine order. And we'll cover this. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Okay, so the Lord is going to appear and then the glory of the Lord is going to appear. But it was for all the people. So that word all. And there came a fire. See, the God is no respecter of persons. The same God that's going to lead me is the same God that's going to lead you. The same God that's going that died for me is the same God that died for you. The same God that Brother James that, that saved you is the same God that's going to save me. 
And so he says here, and he blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And he says, and there came a fire out from before the Lord, and it consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, uh, which, now underline this, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So uh, these many sacrifices, which were all done, uh, uh, done away with by the death of Christ, teaches us, though, that the best service needs washing in the blood. Okay? And that the guilt of our best sacrifices needs to be done away with by one more pure and more noble than they. What does that mean? Listen, for me to go out and do a, a, a burnt sacrifice, I, I need the sacrifice of Christ. That's far better. In fact, the book of Hebrew, the, the key word there is better. It's far better. And, and so uh, what Christ did for us was far better than the issuing of, of blood of lambs and goats. Go back and read the book of Hebrews. It's amazing. So let's be thankful that we have a high priest, uh, which is Jesus Christ. And the priest had not a day's uh, uh, respite from service. That, in other words, every day they had to do this. They didn't take a vacation, but every day. Now, they did do a rotation. Men came in, and, and they, they served for a particular amount of time, and then they went back home to their families, and another set would come in. But this is something that was done always. Remember, we talked about A-L-W-A-Y. That word appears all through the, uh, the Bible. But it was to be done continually. All right? And so we find here that God's spiritual priest uh, had a constant work with the duty of every day that it requires, uh, obedience to Him and, and service to Him, that they would give an account and, and they would do it with joy because they were redeeming the time. So the glory of God appeared in the sight of the people and, uh, and, and, and they had to own personally what this represented and what had, was going to be done. That God was going to die for them personally. God was going to shed His blood for them personally. God was going to save them on a one-on-one -on -one personally. And that God was going to appear unto them and, and show His glory. And so uh, there are no respective persons. I don't care. It, uh, you know, I've been pastoring for 37 years. Well, you know, I, I'm telling you right now that when God looks down that Lady Karen, He doesn't see no difference in you or me. He doesn't count the number of years. But what, what does He count? Probably those times that I really was intimate with God. It's not the amount of years. It's the amount of times I'm with God. Okay? So why? He, he wants to commune with us. He wants to have fellowship with us. He wants to... Uh, talk with us and us talk with him and so he appeared to all the people so that everybody could say wow the same God that appeared you know to Moses and to Aaron appeared to me it was a personal relationship uh, so so we are not now to expect maybe those such appearances but God draws us nigh to those who draw nigh to him the Bible says and the offerings of the faith they were all accepted and, and through the sacrifices being spiritual, the tokens of the acceptance are the spiritual from the, uh, the, the lowest of the low on the, on the financial totem pole to the richest of the rich, they were all equal and, and uh, in God's eyes. So it wasn't about money, was it? It wasn't about personal esteem, was it? It was about being a, a child of God, okay? And so when Aaron had done all that was to be done and the sacrifices, what did he do? He lifted up his hands toward the people and he blessed them. So Aaron could, could but uh, uh, he could have craved all the blessings for himself, didn't he? But you have to understand that we're not here to just to receive the glory in ourselves. We're here to share it with one another, to share the love of God. And so uh, God commanded it. So Moses and Aaron, they blessed the people. And when it happens, something happened. Fire comes down to the altar from the Lord. Look at verse 22, and it says this, And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people, and he blessed them, and came down from offering of the sin offering, and the burnt offering, and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation, came out, and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto what? All the people. Did you get that? God is no respecter of persons. 
And there came a fire out from before the Lord, and it consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, so the word all, all the people saw, what did they do? They shouted, but look at this, and they fell on their faces. You know, when the uh, when everything was finished and the blessings were pronounced, God testified his acceptance. And there came a fire. Can you imagine you're sitting there and you're going through this religious service? All of a sudden, Lady Karen, a fire from heaven just pours out upon upon the people and, and, and it consumes them. You know, in a sense, it would have consumed them for their sins. But instead, it consumed the sacrifice. When the presence of God from the Shekinah glory cloud, when, it, when that fire came down, instead of it falling and consuming the people, it consumed the sacrifice. Now that's what would cause people to shout. Woo! Boy, literally, thank God it wasn't me on that altar, you know. Can you see that, what I'm getting at? All right. And they fell on their faces. They were, they were so humbled for the fact that God literally spared them. I'm going to say it again. They were so humbled that God spared them from the wrath of God. And God's love came down and said, here's what I'm doing. I'm showing, I'm showing you that through the accepting this sacrifice was a picture of His Son, Jesus Christ. That instead of the judgment falling on me, it's going to fall on Jesus Christ. Now we're going to look at this in Acts chapter 2. The fire must justly have fastened upon the people and have consumed them for their sins. But it's consuming the sacrifice was significant of God accepting the sacrifice as an atonement for the sinner. This also was figured of some good things to come. In spot, in, in the Spirit, in Acts chapter 2, Brother James, and I hope that maybe this helps you to understand Acts chapter 2 a little bit more. In Acts chapter 2, it descends upon the apostles in the form, it talks about of a fire, right? And the descent of the holy fire came into the souls of those that were there to kindle them, their, their pious and devout affections toward God, and yet uh, such a holy zeal such a holy zeal, hi Victoria, such a holy zeal as it burns up the flesh and the lust of it is a certain token of God's gracious acceptance of a person's and even their performances. Let's begin to read in Acts chapter 2. We're going to read all of it. So turn there. I do read out of the King James Version Bible. Okay, so follow along. And it says Acts chapter 2. So think about this. In Leviticus chapter 9, we, we have an altar. We have a, a consuming fire, but it doesn't consume the people. It consumes the sacrifice. And the presence of God is felt and shared and acknowledged. And people fell on their faces to worship God and to thank God. Let's read Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost, Penta means 50. So, cost, it was 50 days after Calvary. Pentecost, all right, was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Notice they were all together, they were sitting there, and, and it came to everybody, not just the one, but to everybody. And there appeared unto them cloven, which means split tongues, uh, like as of fire. Now does that start to make sense now? That the presence of God, that God's going to give them the ability to, to have a, a you know double languages in a sense, he said tongues means language, and he says and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a of a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Kind of reminds you of Leviticus chapter nine, doesn't it? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other languages or other tongues, as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Okay. And they didn't give themselves utterance. The Holy Spirit gave it to them. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. And now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and they were confounded, because that every man heard them speak unlike this. 
in his own language. Today we have a lot of different types of religion where you go in and people claim uh, uh, Brother James are speaking in a heavenly language and an unknown tongue and, and all this stuff. And Paul goes, is very clear about this. He said, I'd rather speak five known words than five, you know, 10,000 unknown words. Okay? And, but yet, uh, the Holy Spirit gave them the ability, even though they only knew maybe the one language, but yet they were able to speak another language to the person that was listening. Isn't that amazing? And it says, and there dwelt in, in verse 5 of Acts chapter 2, dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak, what does it say? In his own language. And that's important you understand that. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these speak Galileans? Question mark. And how we hear, look at this, underline this, and how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. That was the miracle to get the gospel out to anyone that would listen. And even though you may not have uh, spoke a language that was from the Galileans, but you heard them speak in your own tongue, the clarity of it. And so he says, here they are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the dwellers at Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, in Asia, and, and Phygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, and Jews, and proselytes. And he says, Crates and Arabians, underline this, verse 11, we do hear them speak in our tongues. And what do they speak? Lady Karen, what does it say? The wonderful works of God. The wonderful works of God. And the Bible says they were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another, what means this? Verse 13 says, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said to them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass, this is, this is the prophecy, it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, <coughs> I will pour out of my Spirit, notice the capital letter S, the God, the Holy Spirit, upon all, circle that word, all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your, son, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, or maidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And the word prophesy means to reveal you know, the truths of God. Did you get that? And he says in verse 19, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now, beside that, you might want to put Leviticus chapter 9 and 10, and we'll go back to that later. Verse 20, the sun shall be dark, turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and noble day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, circle that whole verse. If you just call, you like the thief on the cross. He called upon the name of the Lord. That's how I got saved. There was nothing I could do to save myself. I asked. And you asked. And you asked, right? Verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. He said, I've already validated who Jesus is. He is God, Emmanuel, God with us. And verse 23 says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel for foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. In other words, death could not keep Jesus dead. All right? For David... Speaketh concerning and says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, and he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, 
because verse 27 because thou will not leave my soul in hell neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption so circle that so we know that Jesus when he died uh, some people say oh he died and they buried him and somebody moved his body and his body rotted well the prophecy was is that his soul would not be left in hell nor would thou see thy holy one, circle that word holy, holy one to see corruption. So his body's not going to rot, okay? And even though Jesus died and paid for our sins and went to hell, and go back and read Luke 16, 19 through 31. And he had a conversation, didn't he? With the rich man that was in hell. And he talked about Lazarus over in Abraham's bosom, right? So, but once again, on the third day, Jesus was resurrected by God. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, verse 29, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he both uh, that is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruits of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Verse 31. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. That his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up. Wherefore we are all witnesses. <clears throat> Therefore being by the right hand of God. Exalted. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. He has showed forth this that ye now see and hear. So they're all experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit that came down from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, like a fire upon all of them. He gave them the ability to present the gospel of Jesus Christ in a very clear and dynamic way to anyone that would listen. So verse 34 says, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith of himself, The Lord said unto, uh, unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, and I will make thy foes thy footstool. So even David, who had died, was buried, and in the sepulcher, his bones were there. But Jesus, when he died, he was arose, or he had risen on the third day. His flesh was not there. His bones were not there. He was risen. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, circle that word assuredly, that God has made the same Jesus whom you have crucified. He's made him what? both Lord and Christ. Notice that these are uh, uh, the positions that Jesus holds. He is God. He is Lord. But he's also Christ, the one who's in a position to make intercession for you and I. And he's made him both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. Remember these were corrupt men that were listening and and they wanted to make everybody to believe that maybe that they could find salvation through religion or mankind. So anyway, they were pricked in the heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Here it is. What shall we do? How do we, how do we accept all this? What, what's the meaning of this? And here's what it was. You remember when Jesus said, Repent, or you'll all likewise perish? What did Peter say? Repent. And look at this. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, what does that mean? Repent. As it means to have a changed attitude toward yourself, changed attitude toward God, and changed attitude toward sin. What does that mean? A changed attitude toward sin. It means that whenever you're asking God to come in your heart, you want God to change you. To change the way you live. And, and you want to be more presentable to God in, your, in, in, in what you do. And you'll do that out of love and respect. So repent and be baptized. And baptized is not something that man can do to you here. This would be being baptized of God. Baptize every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Circle that. And so when I, when I realize that I'm getting by the authority of Jesus... By the love of Jesus, he is Lord and he is God, he is Christ, all right, that I'm going to identify with Christ. And he said, I want you to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And it's because we believe that we get what? For the remissions of sin. It wasn't, a, 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 he's not talking about water baptism here. He's talking about by being baptized of the Holy Ghost. That's what, we're, that's what Acts chapter 2 is all about. So the Holy Ghost came down, and so the Holy Ghost began to, to, to open up their, their minds and their hearts and their tongues. They began to speak the wonderful works of God. And so it's because of Jesus Christ. Why, why, why did they, were they willing to repent and identify with Christ? It's because through Christ we can have what? The remissions of sin or the forgiveness of sin. And he said, you shall receive the gift. Look at that, that word gift of the Holy Ghost, the very presence of God. He says, for the promise is unto you and your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Okay? Verse 40. We're going to read down to verse 47 also. And with many words, I'm sorry, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. In other words, don't put your faith and trust in this religious crowd, put it in Jesus Christ. Verse 41, Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they were baptized. That with Baptism of the Holy Ghost is when the Holy Ghost places you in a position to be a child of God. Does that make sense? Had nothing to do with, with all this other stuff, but they were in an upper room, and so they were all baptized by the Holy Ghost when they got saved. And so when you got saved, God placed the Holy Spirit, when he baptized you with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit baptized you into uh, the family of God. That's not something we do with water or anything else. It's something that God has to do. Why? It was a gift. It was a gift. And it says in verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayer. They continued what? Steadfastly. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. They even sold their possessions and goods, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had what? A need. And they continued daily. They what? Continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Singleness of heart is, is with the heart of Christ. And he says, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved or that were saved. So nothing goes to God but what, what uh, comes from God. So we must have grace and that holy fire from God, God the God of grace, else we cannot... Uh, you know, uh, serve him acceptably. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 reveals that. He says, Wherefore are we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved? Let us have grace whereby we may what? Serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So the people were affected with this new discovery, this new truth of God's glory, God's grace. And they received it with the highest joy. Now you start to remember Leviticus chapter 9 now, don't you? When the fire came down, that people fell on their face. And, they, and it says, they received it with the highest, what, joy, triumphing in the assurance given by, to them that they had, that God was close to them by the presence of the Holy Spirit and with the lowest reverence, humbly, Adoring the majesty of that God who manifested himself. So this is a sinful fear of God which drives us from him. But it is a gracious fear that makes us bow before him. In other words, our sin, uh, when you realize that we're not acceptable to God in our present condition, it drives us from God. That's why a lot of people don't want to talk about God. They don't want to read the Bible. They don't want, they don't want to take and hear some preacher preach. They don't want to hear some one that loves them trying to share the truth with them. They'd rather believe a half truth or a three, you know, maybe even a quarter truth with three quarter inch false. Everybody says, well, God will accept me just the way I am. In other words, what they're saying is, 
I have no desire to change the way I live. And, and that's not true. God wants us to, to live in a, in a godly manner so that we can bring godly praise and so that God can interact with you. Now, God is a holy God and he cannot deal with, he cannot live in sin. And so, um, I'm going to be sharing some things with you, even maybe tonight. I hope you'll join us at six. But uh, please understand, when you think about Leviticus chapter 9, and you think about Acts chapter 2, can y'all see the correlation here? And because they understand it was through God's love and God's grace and God's mercy that instead of God's presence consuming them, that Jesus was consumed on the cross of Calvary. But then he didn't just rot. On the third day he arose. And on the third day he arose, it's, it's, he says, "My, your your soul will not, it was prophesied, will not suffer in hell. It will not be left in hell, in other words. And that your flesh will not see corruption. It's not going to rot. Why? Because he's at the right hand of the Father. He's God with all authority. God the Father gave all authority to God the Son. And it was through God the Son that he loved us so much. And so think about it. We go to church and we hear some preacher preach. And, and uh, for most people, most people are still unaffected by it. I can remember a day when, when our church was growing at an extreme amount of rate. People were coming in and the Holy Spirit, with his presence, his anointing was so powerful that when it gave the invitation, we had people before the invitation coming down to the altars because of the presence of God in their life. And, and they were crying and, and repenting and wanting to get things right in their life. They wanted to live for God. And some were coming to get saved. They'd been to church, got baptized. Maybe it was, uh, I remember our, our song director whenever I preached about baptism. And everything, because uh, I thought she had already been saved and baptized and, and, and was assured by the blood of Christ. Come to find out, she loved singing so much that she falsified the evidence. And she came up to me and said, Preacher, the reason why uh, I never responded uh, to the altar is that I'm just not saved. Now, I love to sing and I love to lead people. She said, but I'm not saved. And I came down from that altar where we were at and she and I both knelt on the very front pew on the left hand side of our church and I remember her asking Jesus Christ for the first time to come into her heart and to save her and she trusted in the blood and the presence and she was crying when she got up she <laughs> held me and she said thank you preacher thank you for giving me the truth sharing that with me we baptized her whether we baptized her with water but the Holy Spirit had already baptized her with his presence. One thing that's missing today, oh, we've got the religion, we got the smoke, we got the mirrors, we got all the lights, we got all the special singers. But, you know, when you take all that away, that's probably when we'll find God. Maybe the pandemic was one of those ways to, that when God emptied the churches so that God could fill people up with his presence and hopefully that the church will be filled back up and this time be differently. It's not just about going to church for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, or an hour, and then uh, going out and having something to eat and going back and doing our, what do we do that we do by the world and living by the world and not even recognizing God until maybe the next Sunday, if that. But we're to always, A-L-W-A-Y, we're to always be in the presence of God by uh, being there to communicate with Him. God wants us to communicate with Him. That's it. And you say, well, what does God want me to do? Does God want me to serve him? Well, I'm sure that as you communicate with God, God may lay on your heart to do certain things in your life. But God doesn't want you out there working in a church and serving and doing this without, first of all, being in his presence. And it's because of his presence that causes people to fall on their face and reverence God and love God. And a lot of people think that church is no longer necessary, but it is. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. So we're to come to encourage one another. I told Lady Karen, I said, thank you for always being faithful. Well, James, thanks for being faithful. That Catherine, Victoria, I see y'all are on here. And I never know who all is really on here, uh, you know. But whoever you are and people from around the world, India, those that tune in from us, uh, thank you for your faithfulness and your loyalty. This is not about me. It's about us. 
all of us reverencing God, loving God, praising God, and realizing that when the judgment came down on Calvary because of sin, it fell on Jesus Christ and not on us. We should all be humbled enough to get on our knees and even on a daily basis, even before you go to bed, get on your knee or before you go to work, get on your knees just for 30 seconds. Just say, Lord, I want to, I want to thank you, God, for giving me life. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me everlasting life. Holy Spirit, thank you for empowering my life. And I praise you and I love you and I thank you. And, and I just want to, as I go through the day, help me to have the right words to say to the right person that wants to listen, that they might come to know you as Lord and Savior. The there be one here that might be like the song director that I had that wasn't saved. I was in Abilene, Texas. I was just associate pastor. And the same thing happened there. The, the song director, after I preached, the pastor was gone. I was filling the pulpit for him in Abilene, Texas. And the song director came and got saved on that Wednesday night. See, it's not about the position you hold in a church. It's about the position that the Holy Spirit had placed you in, into the family of God. Go back and read St. John chapter 3. And come to know that Jesus as your Savior. Father, there be one here that doesn't know you as Savior. I pray the Holy Spirit of God will deal with their heart right now. You said, except the Holy Spirit of God, draw them. No man shall be saved. Lord, I pray today that people that might think they're saved and they're not, that, Lord, they would finally come to a place and be willing to repent and to put their faith and trust in your sacrificial lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you'd like to do that, you might want to consider this as an opening your prayer. It's not the prayer. It's the intent of the heart. Like the thief on the cross, you might pray this. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner and I'm guilty. Lord Jesus, I believe that you're God and you hung on that cross. You took on my sins. You shed your blood so my sins could be washed away. And then you died. But on the third day, you arose. And I believe that. I believe you're alive right now. So Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a home in heaven with you when I die. Now, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, Father, thank you for saving me. Thank you for securing me forever with everlasting life. Now, Holy Spirit, I pray that I might always, I might every day continually love you, praise you, and allow you to lead me and how I'm to live my life. And Lord, help me to let your presence be known every day, all throughout the day and the night. And I give you glory, honor, and praise. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people prayed, amen. amen. Hi, David. Good to see you all the way from around the world, my brother. Love you, brother.